Hey, Helen, it's so great to have you back on Psyche Podcast. And I'm really excited to get this chance to discuss this really cool and kind of thought provoking short story that you you recently wrote, Babyface. <laughs> I'm just kind of excited to see where we're going to kind of go with it. Great. I'm excited to be here. No, it's um, super fun. I was just telling you off, off camera that um, Alfie, my partner, just like, he, he's just set up this little publishing thing and there'll be more stuff coming and by the way listeners if you have interesting things that you'd like people to read send it over and we can Alfie and I will read it I mean it's Alfie's thing but anyway but he I just sort of I write a lot for fun and I had just written this thing for a laugh and he I sent it I sent him the first bit he was like oh we're gonna publish this I was like okay we'll see but anyway yeah I let I let him do it <laughs> yeah and then the baby's out in the world for everyone to <laughs> to engage with and, and enjoy so I, okay, I, that, that's kind of where I kind of want to, I wanted to start with, yeah, what's, what, what was like the Genesis story of the short story that you wrote? Well, no, it was funny because Alfie and I were actually, um, we fiddled around with this app and we did get absolutely disgusting kids. I think it was like a, a really, um, so the premise of the short story is it's a, it's a millennial couple and it's sort of supposed to be that the, 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 this couple isn't named. And I recently moved um, to London to be with my partner. I'm not from London. And I sort of, I mean, I've only been here for a number of weeks, but I sort of get this, got this vibe of what it was like to be a millennial in London. <laughs> you know, sort of this, the stock kind of, um, I mean, there's, there's sort of a visual thing. You, you start to pick up on what people of your generation look like, what they kind of wear. And I had lived in, I've lived in lots of different places. Um, I've lived in London very briefly, 10 years ago, and it's very different now. And um, I sort of was kind of interested sort of anthropologically in this millennial Londoner. And so um, we then separately on a separate occasion were fiddling around with this baby face app. And the story is about a couple that's out for dinner. They've treated themselves to a, an expensive dinner and um, they decide to, they're having all sorts of relational issues internally not really sharing how they actually feel and then they do a um a baby face generator app game and they're confronted with the horrifying reality of what their children look like and i it was funny because when alfie and i did this we got really disgusting children and actually the cover is one of the picture on the cover is one of the kids that we got and i just thought you know i wondered like, about that <laughs> yeah, for us it was just like visually visually gross. I was like, oh dear, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just what we really look like. Oh my gosh, maybe we're less attractive than we think. But um, then I thought about, you know, what unconsciously might happen to a couple, um, and I I th was thinking about these um, this sort of maybe this is my projection, but this sort of stock millennial Londoner who I don't I think because of material conditions probably isn't that happy. And has probably had to make a lot of sacrifices um, because material conditions have been so shit for, for the millennial generation. And there was a really set of high expectations that maybe one was brought up with in the 90s or something like that. And then a really not only not meeting that those expectations, but year on year, things have sort of got progressively worse. So um, thinking about how that affects relationships and how maybe people have had to... Um, come to terms with or not, or, or repress these kinds of difficulties. And I thought it would be fun to have some funny thing like a baby face um, predictor be the thing that really throws, the, throws them off and reveals something to them about themselves. But then at the end, I mean, the end of the story, it sort of, it doesn't really, nothing really changes. Um, so I'm not sure that um, that much culturally can change the material reality. So they sort of lump in and get on with it. But, but no, I, I am fascinated by how like material conditions have affected um, the psyche really of the millennial generation and where we are now. I guess this couple in this story are like 35 years old, which I guess is like maybe mid millennial. I don't know, what, is it the same? Do you kind of get that vibe in America that there's been? Because I spent a lot of years in America, a lot of time in America, and it did strike me as very different in London. Some similarities, but some differences. Um, Maybe you could speak to that. I, I'd be curious to know what you saw as the differences between the two places in terms of those millennials you're writing about. Well, it's interesting because I feel like America... Um, 
has obviously a lot more inequality than Europe. Mm. But Britain is a very, very unequal country. And Britain is beginning to feel more and more like, I would say, a poor country <laughs> with a handful of wealthy people in it who come to London because it's one of the major cities in the world. So this already means that normal people in Britain are um, have had to give up on something psychologically in terms of aspiration. Whereas I feel like in America, it's we all know it's a very unequal country. And part of the reason it's unequal is because some people get to aspire to things. And in fact, the whole sort of edifice of the society works on the fact that you could be the person who gets a good job and a good salary. And there's still these opportunities to make six figures and be successful in certain fields where people do have really good jobs. So I think in America, whilst maybe the extremes are more extreme and there's a lot of poverty and definitely, um, I, I, my, my, my first is a long story, but my, my father was a sort of diplomat and we lived in lots of different countries, including in some quite poor places in, in the world in, in um, Africa. And what I saw, for instance, in Los Angeles, I um, was there for a while with my ex-partner who lived in downtown Los Angeles. It was, I, you know, the levels of poverty are, are kind of similar. So you have this, this big range, but there's still this opportunity to believe that you could be the one who it's going to work for in America. There's still... You know, if you get a good job, if you're a tenured professor or if you're in the medical field or if you do really well, there's still those opportunities there. Whereas in Britain, you know, it's um, whilst overall there's probably less inequality because of the way that our economy has gone, not only because of, um, you know, changes uh, within the international kind of um, capitalist system, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and tech and all these kinds of things. We also had, you know, financialization that really affected Britain from sort of the 80s onwards. Um, but we've had Brexit and, you know, Britain has sort of lost its way a little bit. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, living in a major city like London, where uh, you would, you would, you know, one needs a lot of money to, to exist, but then the jobs and opportunities for people are, you know, the, I think a lot of Americans would be quite shocked at, at what people um, earn in in the UK and in Europe, but often in Europe, the cost of living is less expensive. So I think this has sort of created a situation in London where a lot of people have to be here for their jobs, but the jobs don't offer very much. And so there's a perpetual kind of flat share student lifestyle existence that exists well until, you know, 30s, 40s or, or for longer. But then there's a sort of, you know, maybe a group of people who've been brought up with certain aspirations or been to university and, you know, have these still maybe work to kind of have these cultural signifiers. I sort of talk in the story. It is, you know, it's supposed to be funny, but empathetic, you know. <laughs> so there's a, a moment where, um, you know, one I usually write, um, make films, but the one thing about literature that's quite good is you can get inside people's heads and really sort of explain what they're thinking. Totally. And, um, you know, there's a moment where uh, the, the couple who's sort of struggling, they, they can still afford to sort of be the people who are eating the meals in a restaurant rather than working in the restaurant. But they don't realise that they are thinking the same things about struggling in London as the person, as the waiter who's, who's waiting on them. And I think there is sort of this moment maybe, I don't know if it's coming or it's already come, where maybe what we've seen so far has been this sort of, lack of recognition of mutual um if political kind of uh a political situation that affects everybody across maybe things that would have been class you know class differences in the past like going to university or not going to university um and i think maybe there might be a moment where i mean here's hoping people recognize that there are more universal issues at play so that there can be a sort of a collective political movement for for change um, but I think, you know, historically, there has been this divide between, um, you know, not in terms of, you know, even money that people are earning because people get into a lot of debt. I think, you know, the statistics on student debt in the UK is quite interesting, that it's actually higher on average per student than it is in America, which is another, it kind of goes back to that, um, you know, the, the uh, how disparate it is in America, because in America, 
if you go to a private college, it's hundreds of thousands. It's really out of state or whatever. But there is the opportunity to go in state, to get scholarships, to get merit-based scholarships, to get sports scholarships. You know, if you if you have a parent working at a college, all these different things. Whereas in the UK, it's one cost for everybody and there's no scholarships for anybody. So everybody finishes with, I think it now at this point, it's like 54,000 pounds if you take the... Uh, student loan and the um, loan that you would take to for your for your living costs, which is on a, which is a higher average than in America. Which, but the the difference is in America, you know, you're expected to pay a huge amount of interest straight away, and there were sort of schemes that kind of mitigate against how much interest you you pay. And so this is this is funny because it's supposed to be like a a story, like a you know a bit of art, but here we are having like a material analysis conversation. But right. um, <laughs> but. Um, but, you know, in, in Britain, there aren't that many opportunities to make very much money in your career. So I think that it's interesting. You know, I think in America, maybe there's, as I said, there's people maybe still have the aspiration that they're going to be OK. Whereas I think in the UK, there's there's had to be much more of a confrontation of, you know, our, our lifestyle is going to be way lower than our parents. Um, right. But... At the same time, I think there's been a kind of a resistance to it because it's a very, very stark and painful thing to admit and to recognise. Because, you know, I think a friend of mine who's a political theorist says that one of the things that's really difficult for people is what you're born into, the lifestyle you're born into, you assume is going to be yours forever because you did nothing to deserve it. You're just born into it. And I mean, I've witnessed this in lots of examples um, that I see outside in the world where somebody's born into a situation, then it, it disappears. And it's very, very difficult to confront. It's very, very hard. And so, you know, there's got to be a lot of empathy for people. But I think that there's been a kind of resistance to this admitting and also a kind of a desire to, to, to create cultural and politi political signifiers which say, I might not be earning a lot of money, but I went to university. You know, I have the cultural capital and I'm not like another group of people who didn't, who maybe has different values. And I think politically this has played out where um, maybe there's been a lot of political snobbery and this has led to a lack of universal thinking about politics, about how the political system affects everybody by being like, well, you know, I don't associate, associate with this group because they have views I don't agree with. But actually, hopefully, you know, I mean, who I can't predict the future, but it might be something that people recognise that there's, there's more that we have in common than we don't. But no, I definitely, that was a really long spiel. So do tell me to shut up. <laughs> there was, I re definitely recognise that in London. I think I've been very lucky because I'd, whilst London is a great city, I'd been able to live in um, a, a, an area of the UK that was much, uh, much less expensive and uh, much less stressful. And um, so I definitely sort of, have been, you know, impacted by seeing the reality that I know a lot of my friends, for instance, who are artists and that kind of thing, um, you know, and it's not what they expected. Right, totally. Yeah. So, so okay, Helen, I, here, here's kind of one thread that I wanted us to follow a little bit uh, that kind of stuck out to me in the story. And I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but part of me wants to say there's like this faux progressivism. <laughs> I don't know if that's the yeah. right way to put it, but but I think yeah. that is probably important to you to kind of point that out and to kind of like explore how that gets fleshed out sometimes with millennials. Could could you go there, like wh wh where it comes out in the story and, and kind of what you were trying to say, maybe politically? So, so I, there's something, I mean, as I say, like I'm all for, um, you know, progressive ideas. And I think, you know, people have their hearts in the right place. Absolutely. But sure. I think also there's a lot of humor there because I think a humor comes when... Um, two things are, are playing out at the same time. You know, there's a con contradiction. And I think that humor, you know, you can you can bring out humor when there's sort of a repressed contradiction there. So I think that, you know, a lot of people um, these days, and I think it is to do with material conditions, um, feel the need, feel the pressure to have the right kinds of views. And why I say that it's because of material conditions is I think that the precarity leads people to feel like they've got a lot to lose. They could lose everything. And I think that's kind of what cancel culture does a little bit. On the one hand, you have cancel culture, which I think is very real. And I've seen it affect lots of people very sadly. And, you know, it's this real fear that you could be. And I think it also sort of gets you to sort of toe the line and not to say things that. 
But on the other, I think people can become caught up in cancel culture and almost become sort of obsessed by it or start to enjoy it. This is a weird thing, psychoanalytic thing, enjoyment in sort of Lacanian sense, whereby you get to imagine that if, if only it was, wasn't for cancel culture, then you would have this career and this lifestyle that you would aspire to, that you've contingently been prevented from having because, the cult, because of cancel culture. When really, I think it's actually something a bit more depressing, which is the material conditions are so bad that there's so few opportunities that nobody really gets to have the career they aspired to. So I think that sometimes cancel culture, whilst I think it's, I don't support cancel culture in the first instance, it can also take on this sort of secondary obsession in people whereby it mystifies material reality a little bit and gets people to think that the issues that they're facing, the cultural issues, the issues to do with precarity, the issues to do with not being promoted in their careers or whatever is to do with a contingent cultural issue of cancel culture rather than wider economic conditions, which have meant that there's no opportunities for anybody. Does that make sense? Maybe not. No, it does. It does. No, I think it's a great point. So I think the thing is, you know, there's always an ambivalence. I think there's an ambivalence to everything in, in the universe. You know, we, I think we come from like the Big Bang and the Big Bang was just basically a kind of, uh, you know, uh, everything becoming so impacted together that it explodes, you know. So everything's generated from something that's nothing in, in a sense. So um, everything, I think, is sort of marked by contradiction. So on the one hand, you know, when you look at any of these issues, on the one hand, you can say yes, cancel culture has affected people. It's made people feel more precarious and more stressed and less free to express themselves. But then on the other hand, I think there's this, this other dimension, which is to do with how we, we turn it into almost like a kind of, um, a way to, ex like a religious ideological explanation for everything else when everything else is sort of more difficult to tolerate, but also more universal because it affects everybody. Um, but I do think, you know, on that first side that there is this, this feeling of I might lose my job if I say certain things. So it's funny because, you, you know, you always feel, but I think this is to do with cancel culture as well, because you always feel like, oh, I'm going to be cancelled for saying, for even pointing, poking fun at cancel culture. But then, then I sort of think, you know, are you really, and is this just a thing that you fear thinking, oh, what right. I have to say is so important that someone's going to care when really nobody actually cares. You know? <laughs> um, and actually the thing is, you know, when when things when something very bad has happened, yes, then um, maybe you know culture might uh, do its cancelling. But then you know, there's often people, and I've seen this happen, where people who have been accused of things that they haven't done, and you know, so it's, I think it's very very complicated. And I also think it's to do with online culture because you know, in the past, you know, you could have a conversation with your friend down the pub, and it's forgotten. But now everything is is online. And I think that the um, I, I listened to a really interesting talk by this um, Slovenian philosopher called Mladen Dola. He's um, he's actually had this sort of quiet influence on Western philosophy that a lot of people just kind of don't realize. And Zizek, Slavoj Zizek is sort of like the face of Slovenian philosophy and people, you know, and he's fantastic and people kind of know him. But Mladen is a, a very big influence on Zizek and Mladen's sort of a, a shyer kind of person. He doesn't go into the spotlight that much, but he... Um, he gave a talk on um, rumor culture and its effects and mm -hmm. how basically in the past, um, ru you know, when rumor was said about you, you wouldn't hear it. And the thing that's traumatic about rumor is when you hear the rumor. And this sort of then has all sorts of implications on your investment in the rumor and your fear of having rumors said about you. So I remember when I was at high school, I did this really stupid thing with my best friend where we decided to one day tell each other what everybody else bitched about us for. Oh man, that sounds I do not brutal. Anybody, because mm -hmm. you're suddenly oh. confronted by the fact that you're like, oh, the image I have of myself is not at all what I thought. And the thing, I remember the thing that somebody said about me, I, it was something to do with like, um, I wore the same top all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it had nothing to do with like anything I thought about myself and then suddenly you're confronted with either your own ridiculousness or something about yourself that you'd repress to yourself necessarily to sort of keep going in the world so you really don't want to go there but then with um with Twitter 
and Reddit and everything, where the rumor mill happens not only behind closed doors, but in public, but also on a platform where anybody in the world can participate, not just the 10 people in your village. And it's there forever in black and white. And I think there's something psychological about, you know, black ink against white background. It's like it's been printed and it exists. It's like official. There's somebody behind it, even though it's some rando on the Internet, you know, whatever. There's some there's some mind behind it that seems really official. And so there's something about the possibility of being confronted with the rumor that's really stressful. And Mladen talked about how um, there's this French author from the 19th century called Honoré de Balzac who did novels um, that really explored the effect of the printing press on human psychology and the permanence of ink on paper and the permanence of you know, declarations and things being said about people. But I think there's something now about the prol proliferation of this on the internet. And I think this is something that's really psychologically difficult. And there's all sorts of things like the replacement of interpersonal relationships in real life with screen images on Instagram that are always going to appear more whole and complete than they actually are, because it looks like television. It looks like a broadcast. It looks like you know, me a media product, even though it's just a person on their iPhone. And this sort of ups the ante on how alienated we feel, how insecure we feel. So I think we live in an epoch where not only are material conditions really difficult for people, you know, they've had to, um, you know, especially since inflation and, and things like that and COVID, you know, it's absolutely crazy how much people are having to deal with. I mean, I'm always surprised. I'm always like impressed by how much people can take, you know, I think it's really humans have a real sticking power and a real ability to keep going because it's it's really difficult for people. But then not only this, we have this culture that's very alienating in a certain sense, but also very terrifying and very confronting with the possibility of hearing what you've done wrong and why you're a bad person which I, I probably will get a bit emotional when I think about it, because I think this is a lot that people have to deal with. I think it's really, really hard. So I think, you know, what I was trying to do in the story was to humorously kind of play up this idea that all these people, you know, and it's very easy to sort of laugh at people, you know, <laughs> I laugh at myself a lot, I think, right. but to think like, oh, people with prissy views where they say they meet, think one thing, but really deep down they think somebody else, something else. But people are, feel like they have to permanently perform and perform being a good person. And I think it's no surprise, given the challenge to keep a job, the challenge to keep a roof over your head, the challenge to pay rent, and the challenge to be in a universe that feels very unsympathetic to people and very unhuman. So I think that's what I was trying to get at when I'm kind of... The, the opening is about how the, the woman who is going to um, have this anniversary meal with her partner has decided it's okay for her to be able to enjoy her lunch because the, um, the, the chef is of an extraction that's not really politically correct at the moment. So she's done all her research and decided that on balance, it's kosher, she's okay. And I think this is something that, you know, in the past we wouldn't have to think about. Right. We do, and it's not necessarily because we're told to, but we're in a universe where we feel we're always on show and anything could count against, against us. And there's so many people who want our jobs and who need our jobs. And this is also a way that we get separated from one another, right? Because, mm. and I think humor is a way to sort of attempt to knock back the separation because I think a lot of people do feel the same way. And I also think that I was quite surprised. I did a little reading only with a small group the other day and I was I was nervous because I'd written stuff that I felt like, you know, I was point, making a bit of fun at politically correct stuff. And people were laughing, including people I know who are very politically correct. <laughs> so I think <laughs> it is actually, you know, there is more of a universal set, set of concerns that people have than we realize. Yeah, totally. OK, th that's a great reflection. OK, here's kind of where I want us to go, if you're cool with this, is I think it's on like page eight uh the 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 couple starts talking about i think it's like a couple friend or at least the female knows this friend named kate who's yeah. i think at the time in this part of the story it changes later she's i think dating someone named paulo if, yeah, I'm, if I'm saying right. that correctly 
And uh, Impalo's working on a documentary on how monogamy is not ethical. And, you know, there's, there's so much we can say about that. But you have an incredible line. You know, the, the female protagonist kind of disgusted by the documentary, not because of the content, but because she says he didn't have the balls to act directly on his desires. That, that he was basically... Yeah. You know, because his his Kate, his partner, wanted to be monogamous, but he was just doing this documentary to kind of show how monogamy wasn't ethical. He wasn't really kind of facing it head on. So yeah. I know that there's a lot there, but I, I was wondering just to see where you went with that. Like, yeah, no, it's funny because actually this is something a lot of. It's funny the story's a little bit of a mishmash, mishmash of everything I kind of see in real life because I've sure. actually seen this happen. But then I was sort of thinking that I had sort of read it in a certain direction with this couple but then later in the story you'll see that actually maybe this disgust that the main character has at this friend of hers partner making a documentary about how he doesn't like monogamy when the other woman wants to be monogamous it actually turns out that that assessment is totally the woman's projection and that in real life the the friend doesn't want to be in the relationship either you know and I kind of wanted to get to the this idea that like human subjects are much more complicated than we think and often what we assess of the things we see yes it's our own assumption and our own projection and it says something more it's like a raw shark test it says something more about us than it says about and I think basically slightly later in the story and there's this idea that um this friend hasn't been proposed to after a, a bit of time and it actually turns out that potentially, and I'm not even sure myself, but I, potentially the main character is pissed off that it took her partner so long to propose to her, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, but it, it is interesting, this idea. I also wanted to get to this idea of um, that he doesn't have the balls to act on his own desires. Yes. Yeah, and talk about that. That was such a great line. Because I think the thing is, there's, there's this quote from Lacan, right? And I think that, um, which is, um, the only thing one can be guilty of is um, not giving ground in terms of one's desire, which is a very complicated phrase. Yeah, what does that mean? So it's a very, it's a very like mixed phrase, and it's deliberately ambivalent. But I think what has happened is that culture has taken this kind of idea from the '60s in one direction, and I think the result. So Lacan was sort of. I mean, he died in 1981, but he was giving lectures in Paris around the time of the student revolts in 68. But his sort of perspective wasn't quite tied to the, you know, it was actually quite different to the ideology of the students in 68. And I think what came out of 68 was this kind of like um, ideology of self-fulfillment and sort of pursuit of libidinal interest, which in some ways is important, especially in relation to where culture was in the 60s and it had been more repressive and conservative. But if you go back to Lacan, it's much more ambivalent than that. And actually there's, he would sort of argue that there's, yes, you must go after, be, understand your desires. You know, you've got to have the bravery and courage of understanding your desires, but at the same time realizing there's no utopia in your desire or there's no fulfillment in your desire. And this is the challenge of being human, Phil again. But, um, and actually it's a very kind of, um, I would say neoliberal maybe, or like a capitalist kind of idea that there's a single desire that you have or an object that if you get it or if you fulfill it, you'll be fulfilled. And I think the market system operates on that logic. So I think what was sort of picked up in, some of Lacan and a lot of the sort of 68 ideology was this idea of sexual liberation, which is obviously great, but also Lacan's idea was that, you know, you've got to have the courage to go after that, but also acknowledge that there's no transcendent. Um, there's maybe an imminent transcendence in the process of acknowledging your desire and going after your desire, which obviously under the market system, we really, we're told that we are free to do, but we actually really aren't. And this leads to a lot of difficulties but that there's no real promise. And this is sort of supposed to be kind of an anti-capitalist idea that basically it explodes the ideology of promise that you can absolutely be, be fulfilled as long as you achieve something or get something or, you know, whatever. But um, so there's, I think there's this idea and there's pressure in contemporary society to enjoy and be happy and be fulfilled. 
And I think whilst that originally was an idea that was said to be able to explode capitalist ideology, I think that was the part of 68, which was like, you know, sexual liberation will set us free in terms of the market system, but actually potentially that wasn't quite challenging enough and incorporated the idea of sex into the market system, basically. So I think that there's this pressure that everybody feels to be honest about what they desire and be a liberated subject and go after what you desire. But actually, it's much more difficult than that. It's much more difficult. And I don't know of anybody really who is a, you know, I think the challenge comes in, in trying to manage your desire in relation to everybody else's desire in relation to the idea that we believe we're going to be fulfilled and maybe we won't actually be fulfilled. Um, but I think the ideology today really tells us, have fun, be liberated, know yourself, be cool, be okay with yourself, you know? <laughs> and actually, it's so much more difficult than that. And so I think that, so this to go back to this, um, do not give ground in terms of your desire. So you can read this in multiple ways. And two of the main ways of reading it is like a stop sign on a road, which says the word yield on it. Does it say yield in America? It does. Yeah, yield. Uh, yield means give over. Both right. give yourself over to yield to something. It's to like give yourself over to something. But also it means give way. So it says that the quote is do not yield or do not give way in terms of your desire. So it's saying on the one hand, do not yield, give yourself over to your desire because there's no fulfillment in achieving the desire. There's fulfillment in actively pursuing desire, acknowledging that it's not going to fulfill you, but there's no fulfillment in the completion of desire. It's like sex, right? Once you've had the orgasm, it's over. <laughs> you know, it's actually yeah. the process of enjoying sex. That is the kind of imminent transcendence of sex in the first place. Sure. But then other reading of the, of the phrase is, do not yield as in give, stop at the stop sign and let it, let the traffic pass you by because, you know, repressing what you want, not acknowledging what you want, completely being abstinent also is a complete waste. And there's no promise in that either. So the conservative position and the, you know, I don't know, extreme capitalist position are like both wrong, according to Lacan. But I think today what has happened is that idea of there's fulfillment in getting whatever you want because we're in this weird time where it seems like none of us can get what we want because none of us have the resources but at the same time we're told you have to enjoy you have to be liberated the reason you haven't got what you want is because you haven't been brave enough to go after it or whatever so I think we're in this difficult situation where it's all a bit of a kind of tangled mess politically culturally and socially and um, I think this couple is sort of trying to deal with it, this and this woman is sort of maybe angry at herself because I think throughout the story, there's a lot of things going on, repressed and semi-conscious and, and it's not so easy to just know what you want. And also what you want is, who knows what, you know, even if you know what you want, it's never clear how you're going to get it or whether it's absolutely what you want, maybe you want something else. You know? so, so I think what I wanted to try to get at was just how complicated all of that is and how we can often sort of think if only I want I knew what I wanted then it would all be easy and you can sometimes then project your anger at yourself and say like well he should just do this well, really you're telling yourself you think that you should just do this even though that's probably not the right thing to do anyway <laughs> right right no and this is where I think man you know you could have written this beautiful article but but through the medium of this short story that complicated web of desire really came out in some powerful ways and you kind of fleshed it out in, in a way that was very, very powerful, I thought. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if it's, no. it's frozen for a second, yeah. Yeah, I know. Sorry. It's, I think my Wi-Fi is like slow for some reason. It usually is really strong. So that's why it's kind of in and out. So I do apologize about like that. that as well. Ours is really, the last few days, I don't know really what's it's, happened. It's been bad. Yeah. Who knows, right? So, okay. Ah, there you go. Yes. So, okay. I know another kind of question or another place I wanted to kind of go was near the end, you have some reflections, I think on like human love. And uh, let's, let's see if I can, I, I read it a couple of days ago, but so, you know, after they <laughs> create the hideous, you know, like babies through the app and, and, and they really start to kind of struggle as a couple in their, in their conversation, uh, the, the female goes back and she thinks about maybe an article in the New Yorker that she saw. Mm -hmm. 
or that she read that yeah. had this um, this couple that was in their 90s that had been together and, and it seemed like it was quite beautiful. And then that leads her to kind of reflect on um, kind of the nature of love. And, and maybe I'll read it. She says, or you write, perhaps she thought there's absolutely no reason why she loved him, her partner. And that's why she loved him so much more than she loved anybody else. She said as much to him. Maybe they thought that was the very definition of love. What were you trying to get at there? I thought that was very good. Yeah, you know what? I, I kind of, um, this idea of old people is something I find very interesting because I feel like at the end of the day, you know, we're all going to die. And this is something I don't know. I've been feeling this really recently a lot, like of, of how maybe it's it's my birthday in a few days and maybe when the birthday comes around you always think oh I'm another year older and I'm getting you know further and closer and closer towards middle age and then you know how quickly that's gone and how quickly it's all going to go yeah and you know I think that that sometimes um you know when you think about relationships and I I think that you know we're often sold this idea of um the one true love and the twin flame and you know your soulmate or whatever and I think you know, who you meet in life is so random and it's an accident and um, you could have met all sorts of other people and yet you met, meet the person that you end up being with. Um, and the thing I think is really powerful is like when you think about how, how short life really is and how little time you really have left, maybe all of, you know, this couple, all they think, you know, she's thinking about, oh, and he's thinking about, I, I would want this and this woman's a snob and this woman's saying, oh, I, I think he's, he has, he doesn't have the same taste as I do and all this kind of stuff. And I would have wanted someone else, but then maybe it just sort of comes down to this idea of, you know, when you really think about the finitude of things, do you want to spend time, the rest of your precious time with this person? But I don't even know if that's a definition of love. I don't know, but I had just thought about old people recently and how, we do a lot to deny aging. I mean, we're, we're constantly aging and then therefore constantly dying. And I was, you know, if you think about things like senior citizens' homes and stuff where sort of the image of an old person is managed away. You know, we yeah. don't really think about these things. And we're also busy just trying to survive. I think it's interesting because I feel like we're, you know, survival and economic survival is really much more like it was 100 years ago than it was 30 years ago. But I think a hundred years ago, people had shorter lives. They were maybe much more conscious of death. And they also had religious traditions that gave them reasons to be together. Mm. And I think, you know, now we have the same maybe, maybe levels of precarity and precarity and fears of scarcity that there have been in the past. But we don't really have this idea of our finitude as much. And we also don't have these traditions which obviously come with a downside you know a lot of those traditions are repressive but they also are an answer to a lot of people mm. and a way to um deal with just the difficulty of life so i yeah i have been thinking a lot about mortality and death <laughs> and i don't know why but as i said maybe it's my birth maybe i'm getting older but um and i think that you know it's a weird one where I do think that we repress that quite a lot, but that maybe in thinking about it, and I'm not saying that this is a solution. I don't, I don't know really what is, what solution there is other than doing some sort of major political reorganization or economic reorganization, but I obviously like don't have any answers, but mm. you know, that thinking about really how short life life is, it does make you think about, how we organize society and how much suffering there is and how alienated we are from each other. And it does make it seem a little bit ridiculous. But here's me living like everybody else. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm not somebody who's going to lead the revolution by any means. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm even less so. But I, I you know, and, and I and I'm always conflicted about this because I know the the word love is so you know cheesy and, and it's probably overused but but I'm just so glad you brought it up in in your short story and I, I guess I still want to believe that it's a really powerful concept exactly in, no, in, I, I in think so. terms of human existence and and kind of what it what it strives for and what it can do for us 
I also, you know, I didn't want it to just be a, I, it's funny because I don't know if you've seen, you know, like the White Lotus and success. Oh my God, I love that show. And they're great, right? They are great and they're very entertaining. But then also I sort of feel like they're very cathartic. And it's also a way that you could be like, look at all these silly rich people being silly, you know, but they're not like me and I can see that they're silly, but I'm not like that. So I kind of didn't want, because satire is obviously very powerful, but I also didn't want to be like, look at these silly millennials, these silly people who went to university think they're better than everybody else, you know, because actually at the end of the day, they're also human beings who also love and who are also basically, you know, I feel like everything you write is partly yourself, right? You know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I think it isn't, you know, so um, I wanted, I did actually want to end it on a sincere note because, yeah, I feel like, you know, comedy has a real power to bring people together, but also sometimes you can laugh at people instead of, you know, think about. Totally. They're also, you know, human beings like all of us who do, however ridiculous we all are, we do want love and we do want connection. Yes. And we're all just giving it a go, you know. Oh, no, absolutely. You yeah, know, and I think, you know, because I am I'm kind of at the edge of being a millennial. I was born in 1985. Yeah. But I, I think, again, I, I go back to it's almost sometimes it's not cool to talk about love or you know, I'm, yeah. uh, we're, we're too progressive for this or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in like more political ideas, but uh, not that I have the best way to think about love or any of the answers. But just lately, um, like I've, I've been really getting into this uh, German psychoanalyst who was kind of after Freud was kind of critical of Freud in some ways, Eric Fromm. And he was just oh, really yeah. big on the power of human love. And, and there's some problems in his thinking, but but I've been going back and thinking, damn, this is such an important concept even in the modern world. Absolutely. I know. And I think the thing is, it's like so much in human life gets commoditized, you know, and obviously oh, yeah. dating apps is a, is a funny one. Maybe we should do a, a, a short story about dating apps. I've got, Oh, some you should. Cause uh, I did dating apps very briefly. I came out of a very long relationship at the end of the pandemic and I had missed the dating apps before. And then I did like a little bit of dating apps. And then I met my, my partner in, in real life. Uh, it's so fun. It is very funny dating apps, but it's also trying to sort of commoditize at least the um, the start of something, you know. And is love something that you can really commoditize? And is it isn't it a tragedy that even if it is something that you can engineer with a bit of technology or whatever, isn't it just a tragedy that it's reduced to that? And does it actually work? Right. I don't know. It's interesting that the app Hinge, the slogan is designed to be deleted which i think is very suspicious because it's like how do you make a profit then that's a so great point not, maybe designed for a few people to delete so that it gives the illusion to everybody else that it works but then everybody else has to be kept on it's sort of like prevented <laughs> from the right person so they keep subscribing um but yeah no i think that i mean i don't know if it was i didn't uh end up in a long-term relationship with anyone i met on Hinge, but I did meet some wonderful people and it was very interesting. But yeah, I don't know. It is maybe, maybe that'll yeah. be the next story. Maybe it'll be the next story, yeah. But it's it's sort of tragic, really, that when you think about I mean, we live in a capitalist system, who am I to change it? But you know, that profit is being made by some big oh, corporation yeah. um, on people's attempts to go out there and and find somebody yes okay so helen was was there anything else about your story that you feel like i missed asking you about i know we touched on a couple big themes that, that there was a lot there i'm sure that we could talk about but yeah. i wanted to make sure that i i didn't miss asking you something that you really wanted to talk about or highlight hmm yeah i don't know it's just I think we've talked about a lot, you know, I kind of guess I just wanted to to um, do something funny, maybe slightly political, um, but also mostly to, to show in a story form just how messy everybody is inside and how nobody, you know, people don't know who they are and what they want and what they desire. And they also most certainly don't really know what other people want to desire. And I think right. it is, you know, quite funny when you think about it 
Um, but I also, yeah, maybe wanted to show that it's okay for people to have doubts about mm. certain things and to, to acknowledge that they feel pressure to think certain ways. And that, yeah, maybe, maybe the love that you are taught about in a rom-com isn't necessarily what really love. Because even though this couple, maybe, you know, they've, they've got lots of issues in their relationship. At the end of the day, I think, you know, is that, is that bad? Does that mean that they shouldn't be together? Everybody has right. issues. Right? Yeah. And, and to try to pursue a fantasy where there's no issues, ooh, is I think yeah. a path toward heartbreak and a lot of pain. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's that's really something that, you know, we're we're sort of fed all the time, you know. Oh there's, yeah. There's you know, all you have to do is ignore, you know, get your desires straight and whatever. But you know, at the same time, on the other hand, completely be, becoming a nun, I mean maybe it's a solution for some people, but but I don't think philosophically it's a, a solution personally. I think, you know, we live in a world we have eighty years or so if we're lucky and We've got to try to make the best of it. Yeah, no, totally. And and I guess I'm, I can only speak for myself, but you know, I like I I know I work with a lot of like men who are on the autism spectrum, and they end up kind of being alone for a lot of their life, and it's it's really tragic. And I'm I'm just cautious in saying that because I know some people want to be alone and single, and that's wonderful. But I know for me, and 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 I think probably most people having some type of deep partnership i'm not saying is the only way by any means but it does provide a type of meaning even Absolutely. though there's a lot of struggle and issues and conflict and pain but i guess this I is the human yeah. experience and i think the thing is the more precarious people are you know in society and economically obviously the more people need one another and this yes. is maybe it's too much pressure i think this is also something that i wanted to bring out in the story about how yes. Often young people, I feel like a lot of the sort of 19th century themes, the kind of books you read, like Pride and Prejudice, about being saved by right, the right. odd means, you know, in a, in a love relationship, because otherwise, you know, it's a way to escape pre eternal precarity. And I see this all the time. And it's not only in the past, it was, you know, historically women looking for the security of a, of a man. Sure. But I've seen women, um, men do it as well. And I've heard of lots of older women getting lots of younger guys wanting to be in their relationship because they provide something. So, you know, it's interesting how I think different material conditions affect relationships, but there's also um, this sort of accelerationist dynamic that people are kind of pursuing, which is the family abolition, which is this idea of family. So for Mark, Marx, there was this idea that family provides a bulwark against like the difficulties of capitalism. But some people read it as it's a symptom of capitalism and it's mm. a way to keep money in certain groups. And if you get rid of the family, then you'll have the revolution. I am not as optimistic as that. I'm not a utopian myself and I, I don't think anything's no. guaranteed. You can just make things worse and worse and worse. So I'm very much on the side of family. But I also understand that people have lots of difficulties in their families. Yes. Difficulties in relationships. And so, you know, I can see that, you know, some people... As you say, some people may be better off not, you know, they don't they don't want a relationship, or maybe some people have been really damaged by relationships, or right. um, maybe damaged is the wrong word, but you know, affected and and had a real, you know, difficulty that they've been confronted with. So I don't think anything is a solution, but I think that it, it's interesting that relationships might be affected in a certain way, and I definitely think that there's some kind of novel to be written about, you know. Uh, Elizabeth Bennett is a man, you know, <laughs> As in, you know, some, some, but I, it's interesting because I remember a friend saying that he had this really famous um, Marxist literary theory on his English degree at university. And he um, did this big Marxist analysis of um, Pride and Prejudice and how it's a class, it's a Marxist novel and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, mm, whilst it does really clearly point out, you know, this set of women from a family who, are not land and gentry enough that they can go um, go without marrying into money. So it's you know very class conscious in a way, but it does sort of fold into this utopian ending where Elizabeth Bennet and Jane Bennet, the the good and righteous sisters, get the perfect union and they marry what would now be sort of like ultra high net worth people and la di da di da. They go off into the sunset. <laughs> 
is the storyline of every, and it is the genre of the rom-com. Like the rom-com mm-hmm. is structurally, and the rom-com is, I would argue, the sort of ideological capitalist depiction of love, that there's someone out there for you who will, it ends with the marriage. It doesn't start with the marriage, you know, it ends and it's, they walk off into the sunset, all their money issues are solved. There was a bit of difficulty along the way, a bit of conflict, maybe the man was a bit stuck up, but the woman, you know, is picked from obscurity and it's all fixed and la di da di da But we we all know that that's bollocks, right? <laughs> but it is the kind of, um, like Bridget Jones obviously is a, is a remake of Pride and Prejudice in what was contemporary London and sort of like the late 90s, early noughties. And, you know, when we're depressed and we need a bit of um, reprieve from how difficult life is and lightness and uh, being removed from how difficult, you know, we eat some ice cream and we watch a reassuring story like Pride and Prejudice or um, or uh, Brian, uh, Bridget Jones. But in reality, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so whilst, whilst the, the bulk of the storyline is quite class conscious, it sort of folds into this utopian exceptionism, which I kind of, yeah. I mean, I enjoy a bit of Jane Austen. It, no, I think I, she's also, but I just. I love yeah. rom-com. I mean, he, see, now, I don't know. Have you ever, have you ever read the book by Mari Ruti on um, Pretty Woman? No, interesting. I'd be interested to to read it because um, it's a very interesting in in terms of that analysis. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And I mean, there's so much in there we could talk about. But one thing that just really struck me, which to me seems so consistent with why I loved her work and and continue to really benefit from it, is she's so nuanced in that she said, you know, there's so many problems with the rom com like genre in terms of like how it promotes capitalism and all this stuff. But she was speaking from a female perspective. There's things that also feel empowering to women. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like a both and there's tremendous issues and she really hates them. But at the same time, she's like, I love watching them and it's very empowering. And, you know, there's aspects of femininity that it, that it brings out that are really good. And so I'm, I'm always struggling with like the nuances of things. And the thing is as well is there's no problem with marrying a rich man either i mean right why the fuck not or a rich woman if you're a man why the fuck there you go um and also you know there's nothing wrong with enjoying what you enjoy you know the we we we're structured by our desires from a very early age we can't control them and we can and you know i i have lots of female friends actually who enjoy the participation in the dating scene in the hope that they might get a man like this but then you wonder they seem to enjoy the dating so much that potentially they never really actually want to be with the man but they have this fantasy that's of a good point that the chase that they enjoy and they enjoy the sort of actually as you say the empowering thing of maybe seducing a man or whatever so yeah it's all there definitely yeah but that's a if i i, I think you would really enjoy that book it's, it's a yeah. good one no i'd love to read it yeah absolutely so Helen, if, if someone's wanting to kind of read the book or, or, or check out like this publishing house that, that your partner, you know, is a part of, where, where, where can they go online? Where, where, where would you kind of point them to? So if you go to everydayanalysis.com, okay. you can get a um, copy there. So you can buy a print copy and a download copy. And also if uh, you would like one for free, obviously we... Um, charge an amount to sustain the press right but if you don't have the means to purchase it you can email alfie and he will send you a digital copy and that is Al- should, I, should I just say the email address yeah sure so it's alfie.baum so it's a-l-f-i-e dot b-o-w-n at r-h-u-l dot a-c dot u-k and he will perfect a free copy. Okay, wonderful. Well, hey Helen, I'm I'm just so grateful for your time. This has been a really fun conversation. I, I really enjoyed reading the story. Like I said, it was cool to kind of wrestle with some of these big ideas in that format in that medium. I, I don't usually do that, so it was kind of a treat. So I appreciate it. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no, I'm glad it, I'm glad you enjoyed it because you never know. I mean, I haven't written a short story for a long time, so it was fun to write, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes. Okay, well, well, thank you. And yeah, I hope that you'll be back on the podcast at some point. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Kiki.